Welcome to My Life, Chassidus Applied, episode 94. And let's begin talking about Zeus Hanukkah. Why is the day called Zeus Hanukkah? So the technical reason for that is because the passage that says Zeus Hanukkah Samizbeach, Hanukkah was called Hanukkah because they rededicated the Mizbeach, even though the focus is on the Meneda, but the Mizbeach was also defiled. And as a result, we called Hanukkah Hanukkah, Hanukkah Samizbeach, Hanukkah Samineda. So Zeis Hanukkah Samizbeach, as explained in different places, on the eighth day of Hanukkah is the conclusion, so it's called Zeis Hanukkah. But it still begs the question, why Zeis Hanukkah? So the Rebbe published in Tovshin Yud Aleph a maimer called Baruch She'osan Nisim Laviseinu. A Hanukkah maimer said by the Alter Rebbe, in Tov Kuf Samach, the year after the Geul of Yutas Kislev, a classic Maimon, is later p- printed in uh, Eira Teira, Volume 5, Bereshis, Hanukkah Maimorim, where we're going to be, the Maimon begins on what page? On page um, 1914, or Tov Tov Kuf Nun, Zayin Omid Beis. And at the end of Siv Dalad, the Rebbe, in a number of years, in Tov Shin Yud Gimel, Tov Shin Yud Dalad, and especially elaborated in Tov Shalamites, then it was Shabbos Pasha Miketz, it's Tov Shalamites, and the Fabringen of Zeis Hanukkah, Tov Shalamites, the Rebbe elaborated on the Tzemach Tzedek, which, say, citing that this is a mimer from the Alter Rebbe, yet it's hard to distinguish what was from the Alter Rebbe and what the Tzemach Tzedek added afterwards. But there he brings about Zeis Hanukkah. Um, but before I go to that, let's talk a moment about this mimer. This mimer has a special chshivas and value, as the Rebbe quotes there, um, from the Sikh of the Friedrich Rebbe, there's a classic Sikh in the Kutte de Burim, where the Friedrich Rebbe talks about this Maimer and its impact that it had. And one of the things in this Maimer was that the Alter Rebbe spoke strongly, being Mavatl, dismissing Aveda Shabalev and Midas, and focusing a lot on the Aveda Shabizbon and Shabameach, which, of course, as we know, that the Alter Rebbe, it's a, it's a Chabad and Chagas, meaning Mechen and Midas, and yet he focused on it. That way, because he was being mavatl the chetzen is the koch that year after the geula, the chassidim got involved lots more in, in external expression of emotions, so he was tempering that to bring it back in his yashvus, as the Friedrich Rebbe says there. So it's a uh, very interesting maimer. I just should note that when I worked in Sefer Lakutim, we obviously had the access to the Tzemach Tzedek and we were learning it all day. So we so I discovered on page Tofresh Dalad, Omar Aleph, in the maimer of Noyach, he actually brings that, and he says in the parentheses that the, the Samach Tzedek says something very interesting. He writes there about, again, the same idea, focusing on the Veda of Mechin as opposed to Midas. So he says in the parentheses these words, I have a doubt in my mind. I wonder whether he didn't say this, in other words, but only as a Hira Shah Bulvad, only as a time, as a I think that was necessary for that moment, for that time. Because as, as I, I remember, as it's uh, engraved in my memory, that, um, that, that the Alter Rebbe said this, it doesn't say chsidim, to those that you had to remove from them their... Um, um, their uh, involvement in, in tenuous chetzenius and uh, superficial or external expressions of rishpei esh, which of course is consistent with that sikha from the Friedrich Rebbe in the Kutte de Burim. Just if you want the page number, let's give the source for that. The Kutte de Burim is, um, it just says liquid base esur aleph here. Okay, so I don't have the page number. And there's also sikha yud base Thomas tofres sadik aleph. So it's considered a valuable maimer. All my modern are valuable, obviously, but has a, a special quality of coming after you, Kislev. And in that Maimer, the Samach Tzedek brings at the end of, as I said, on page Tov Tov Kuf Samach Bey Zomar Aleph in Eira Teira Hanukkah, and the Rebbe explains it at length, what does the Samach Tzedek bring? Two interpretations on why we call it on, on, on uh, Zeis, on the word Zeis. He says the following, that number one, it's it's like Shmei Nesimei HaMeluyim, when they dedicated the temple, the Mishkin, so the Shemini was the eight days that they dedicated the Mishkin in the, during the Midbar. 
So it's connected those, and the Tzamshachim is Shiva Yem and the Atik, Shem Yemei Kedem, it's Tzamshachim from the seven days of Atik, the seven midas essentially of Atik in Keser, Vuhu B'chinus HaBesem, Meshav Shemen, Ad Shanim Shech, Api HaMidas HaElu, Koyach HaChachma L'Gilei B'Malchus, Vuhu Yem Shemini L'Bimiluyim. So what is it? It's taking the seven of the Midas of Atik, going through the Midas of Atsilas and being Nimshach and drawn down into Malchus. That's the uh, that's the, the Zeus, has the two letters Zion Aleph. So it's the Zion being Nimshach into the Aleph, and that makes eight. The eight days of Milumen. He says, Cain Mashman, that's Mashman, Zeachia, the Gimel, the beginning of Pasha Shmini. And Al Derech Zeh, you could understand the Shmini Simei Chanukah. That's one explanation. And that's why he says, Yem Hashmini is called Zeis Chanukah. Zeis Chanukah is Mizeach. Zeis he Malchus. Zeis is Malchus, which is receiving from the seven higher Midas, all the way from Atik. Elsewhere it explains, the Rebbe Tzeich is in a footnote that's in the Kutta Teir in the Rosh Hashmini, it says, B'yem Hashmini is Shilach. Okay? Lehepach, an opposite interpretation. She'inya Ches Yomim, that the eight days is like Oz, that the Zion Midas are receiving from the Aleph, which is Keser, or from the Klolos Gimel Roshenish, which is Kachab, Keser, Chach, Mabin. So it's the exact opposite. Is the Aleph receiving from the Zion, or is the Aleph being Mamshech into the Zion? So the Rebbe explains in Tav Shin Yud Gimel, he says that it's Hobo Hatalia, because you could say that in order to draw it down into B- Malchus and to Biyah, you need to go into Keser to reach from there. That itself also needs explanation, but I'm just citing what the Rebbe says. But in Tavshin Lama Tess, Zeis Chanukah, and just bear in mind, that was a year after the Suddha Seida of Zeis Chanukah, Tavshin Lama Tess, the year when the Rebbe had the heart attack on, on Shemini Atzeres night, so we know that, that to be Muslim, so to speak, the Fabrengen of Simchus Teda, the Rebbe and Kesha Brocha, the Rebbe washed for Zeis Chanukah, and that, and that was a whole parsha in itself. He kept it as, he told the Rebbe, Yankel Hecht, and Uncle Hecht asked permission to tell one person, he told his brother, and obviously that got out. And Zeis Chanukah, Tov Shalom Etches, the Rebbe washed to the Suda and gave out Kesho Bracha and explained that Sukkis, that Chanukah is Kenegat Sukkis, like the seven, eight days of Sukkis, Shmini Atzeres. So Zeis Chanukah is Yemash Shmini of Chanukah, is like Aldar Achzeh, is similar to that, and therefore that was like so called uh, consummating or completing what which was missing in uh, Tishrei. A year later, Zeis Chanukah Tov Shalom Etches, the Rebbe elaborated on this at length. I'm not going to sum it all up. I'm not going to elaborate on it right here. I'll just sum it up and say that the Rebbe wonders whether the two interpretations are two interpretations of Zeis Chanukah. The Rebbe concludes that it's mashma. It seems that there are two interpretations in the word Oz, but as far as Zeis Chanukah, in leaning that's the first interpretation, which means we mamshik from the highest levels of Atik into Malchus. Now all this is esoteric words. We talk about applied chassidus. Let's apply this. The, in, in the number of sikhas, and I especially focus on Zeis Chanak Ketov Shem Mem Aleph, to the children. So even though the Rebbe spoke to the children in a language that was seemingly tzugenglech uh, and uh, appropriate to the children, however, within it lay many depths of uh, chassidus, and even though it was, in a sense, deceptively simple in its wording. The same is with the sikhas the Rebbe spoke for the women, to those that know, you can know that in these sikhs you find tremendous insights, but spoken in this simple language. So in that Zeis Chanukah Tov Shemamal, the Rebbe says, what is, what is the Heirah of Zeis Chanukah more than other days of Chanukah? So we know every day of Chanukah, we Mesei according to Beis Hill, the Halach is Beis Hill, that every day you add and increase a candle until the point, and the last day there's eight. Shammai says, that we begin with eight, then we go every day like the Pare Hachag, Sukkis again, and you go down, you decrease in number from eight to one. The last day of Hanukkah, you would light one candle. Well, Hill says, you may say, Now, what does that mean practically? It means that every day we're increasing in what? In the light of the Neshama, Neir Hashem, Nishma Sodom, and the light of Neir Mitzvah, Vetera Er. So the Rebbe, using the language of Tzivus Hashem, the army of Hashem, that when you have the, the what is the darkness? The darkness is the dark side that comes from the Yetzirah, comes from the evil inclination, the temptations that come from the animal soul. The light refers to the light of the divine soul, like he says in Tanya chapter twelve. So Hanukkah, each day you're going in an assault. It's an attack, basically of attack against the darkness of the world, the darkness within our hearts and souls, that we attack it with with positive light. 
When is the full assault? Those are the Rebbe's words. The full, uh, the full assault is on the last day of Hanukkah. You're taking all the eight flames, which is the most powerful. Even Begashmi, physically, creates the most light. And it's a full assault. Which essentially is, if you think about the words in Api Kabbalah, Api Chsidis, taking the Zayin Yem and the Atik, you're taking the intensity of the Eir HaBligvul. Keser is, the, Keser is Makif, and it's coming from the transcendent energy as opposed to the energy within the structure of existence. And you draw down those seven dimensions, those seven emotional infinite energy into Malchus, which means into our lives, as Malchus ro- rules and governs existence. In the language of Chassidus, Malchus is Yered in Biyah. So you're taking that energy, and on Zeh you have that intensity of the, of the Zion going into the Aleph. Now, even according to the second interpretation, that it's uh, the, the seven are receiving from the Aleph, it's also referring to Keser at the end of the day. That you're referring to Keser, and Keser, it draws it down into Midas. But there, the Midas are on a lower level. Here you're talking about as being on a higher level, which is interesting. Then this same discourse with Alter Rebbe was being mavatl and was uh, minimizing midis. He talks about this point that you draw down the midis because obviously the point here with the tzeira shah was just for that time. It was to tell us that there needs to be balance. There needs to be balance. We have to have passion, but the passion has to be in the language of the Rebbe. It is the teyu and kelim the tikkun. So on Hanukkah, the last day of Hanukkah, we don't just jump to the last day. You gradually grow in a person's life, which applying it to our personal lives is in every challenge. Tafasta marubu le tafasta. You go ma'at ma'at agarshenu. You don't grab everything. If you bite off more than you can chew, you usually don't succeed. So you go step by step. But then comes the time when you need to have the full assault, so to speak. So here we have a day, Zeis Hanukkah, this last day of Hanukkah, that gives us the power to um, take on the greatest challenges and know that we can be successful and be victorious. Because we're drawing down the Aleph into the, the Zion into the Aleph. And even in the second interpretation, I say it's also casted into the Midas. So that's a thought about Zeis Hanukkah and uh, according to Chassidus. Since it's also this week is Hey Tevis, so let me just share something about Hey Tevis. Hey Tevis, of course, in the year Tavshin Mem Zion, that would be uh, um, 29 years ago, was the victory in court about the Svarim. And the Rebbe made a big thing about it, even though it was connected to a lot of pain. But at the end of the day, the result was, as, the, as Judge Sifton wrote, that the Rebbe Alein belonged to Chassidim. In the words of the Rebbe Tzachayim Mushka, which became such a uh, de- definitive uh, element in the case that was that essentially sealed it, was what, that what, when she was asked the question in her deposition, um, uh, uh, she was asked the question, who do the books belong to? Who do your, father, your father's books belong to? To the Chassidim or to the Rebbe? And her response was that the Rebbe himself belongs to Chassidim. When the other side heard that, they say they throw down, threw down their pencils. Now, it's known that depositions are not exactly something you welcome. It's uh, somewhat humiliating. It's, it's meant to intimidate. It's meant to catch you in a word. And, um, and the Agudah uh, Shchidah Chabad was trying to avoid that the Rebbe would have to give a deposition. But then when they saw they had no choice, so they came to tell the Rebbe, and they said they tried very hard. And the Rebbe said, what are you concerned about? She can, she, she'll, she'll do very well. And then not only did she do well, she did excellent. And the Rebbe said afterwards, you see, I told you, what was there to worry about? So it ended up, ended up being that piece of testimony captured the essence of Hey Tevis, which is the Nitzchiyas of a Rebbe. It's a, really, a beautiful sikh of Vayikra, Tov Shemem Zayin, that same year, right after Hey Tevis, Vayikra is a little later, Shredish Nissen begins the, saying the Nisim, and the Rebbe talks about the Nitzchiyas of a Nasi, tremendous sikh where he captures the same idea, obviously according to Chassidus. And the relevance to us today is clear. Maybe 29 years since then, and it's 21 years since Chav Gimel Tammuz, and 23 years since Chav Zayin Adar, we have to remember that the eternity of Teira, the eternity of Chassidus, the eternity of the Rabbeim lives on. Whether we understand it completely and what form it takes, that's, that's a different discussion. But that the emes of it, the truth of it, lives on, and our job is to be the arms and legs, to be able to carry these ideas. Because what was Hey Tevis at the end of the day? It was an Etzachah for Sfarim, as the Rebbe made it clear, which was learning. The learning in the Svarim. It wasn't just Svarim to have them collect dust on shelves. The Rebbe was very em- emphatic about that. He actually printed then a Sefer. That was one of the books that were taken. They reprinted from uh, Ibn Gabay, the Bala Veda Sarkadish. So they printed a Sefer from him, Shad, um, Dera Hamuna. 
And the Rebbe spoke about it that year, Metav Shem Emches, by Yetzei, the whole Indian of Chassidus that we'll be talking about a bit later, the ideas of how the Ebrister has to, and that has to create the Esther spheres, the ten spheres. So the idea is to learn. So Hey Tevis is about learning and bringing it into actual learning. So that's the, that's the purpose of the day. And learning is a non nafshik service Yehovah's. You want to have the Rebbe, the etzim of the Rebbe, the etzim of the Ebrister. Anechi is a non nafshik service Yehovah's. I have placed, I have engraved, I have written my soul in, in these words. So the words is what captures as we say. This is how you take me. This is how you contain me. How can we can contain God and tzaddikim deim lebedim tzaddikim through the words that they share with us and that they taught us. So Hey Tevis is a day to reconnect on that level. And of course coming from Hanukkah, Hanukkah was about the Nitzachan of Teda. Lashkicham Teda Secha, Lavira Mechukir Itzenecha. The Yavonim, the Greeks wanted to eliminate that element of the divine Teda. No problem. As doctrine that teaches morals and ethics and philosophy, they had no problem with that. Their fight was with the spirit of it. That's why we celebrate Hanukkah through light. Light is spirit. The spirit of it. So, so Hanukkah is connected directly to Teda in that sense. The Teda, the holiness of the Teda. And then we come from Hanukkah, that light conquers all darkness. to Tehei Tevis in honoring that in the Nitzchis and the eternity of the Rebbe and his teachings and of all the Rabbeim, and call it Teir Kula. Okay. Um, let's go into some subjects and let's do some, as well as some follow-up. Let's start with a new question. The Rebbe's advice to the judgmental. I can't tell being judgmental, this writer writes, especially when I go to, sh- go to shul and see people doing things that are inappropriate and should not be done in a shul. I'm sure that harboring these feelings is wrong, but my feelings are substantiated by halacha and proper shul etiquette. What should be my approach? Am I correct in being judgmental and critical, or should I change my attitude? So by divine providence, a letter came my way, which I shall read just a summary of this letter. First of all, let me find the letter. There was a fellow, a doctor, that came to my classes, and so to speak, as like a... uh, I guess as a gift, he gave me a letter that the Rebbe wrote him, which I've never seen published anywhere. And I'll just read an excerpt. This letter is dated 16th of Tammuz, 5720. It's an English letter. And, uh, and then the Rebbe, you write about meeting a Jew in the course of your travels who comes to the synagogue to help make up a minion. It's the Rebbe writing. Yet at the same time, reads the newspaper. So he comes to the synagogue to help make a minion, but at the same time, this Jew reads the newspaper. Everyone, of course, reacts to an experience in a way that is closest to him. Thus, for my part, I make the following two extreme observations. First, I see in it the extreme Jewish attachment which one finds in every Jew. For here is a person who has wandered off to a remote part of the world and has become so far removed not only geographically but also mentally and intellectually as to have no concept of what prayer is or what a house of God is, etc., yet one finds in him that Jewish spark, or as the old Rebbe, the founder of Chabad, expressed it in his Tanya, the divine soul, which is truly a part of God. This divine soul, which is the inheritance of every Jew, seeks expression as best it can, and in the case of this particular Jew, it seeks expression at least enabling other Jews to pray congregationally, and he therefore goes out of his way to help them and at the same time be counted with them. That's one point. My other observation, the Rebbe continues, following from the above is as follows. If, where the odds are so great against Jewish observance, yet a Jew can remain active and conscious of his Jewishness, it can easily be seen what great things could have been accomplished with this particular Jew if, at the proper time, he should have received the right education in his early life, or at least the proper spiritual guidance in his adult life. This consideration surely emphasizes the mutual responsibility which rests upon all Jews and particularly on those who can help others. I will not deny that the above is said not in the spirit of philosophizing, but with a view to stimulate your thinking as to your own possibilities in your particular environment and what the proper attitude should be. We must never despair of any Jew, and at the same time we must do all we can to to take the fullest advantage of our capacities and abilities to strengthen the Jewish consciousness among all Jews with whom we come in contact for one can never tell how far-reaching such influence can be. 
Now they talks about some other matters, but a tremendous letter. The Rebbe completely bypasses the fact that he's reading a newspaper and sees the Jew for what he is. So judgmentalism is no room for judgmentalism, period. Obviously, it all depends on a person. If you have someone that you know, that you can expect more and you could talk to them, by all means. But judgmental, or judgmentalism always has the fear that you're using it as Chassidus brings in Galecha Samit Seyed and Derech Mitzvah and other places, that it's garments that are too long when a person can, can sometimes it feeds into your own judgmentalism as a human being. And Slav Davk, it's not necessarily connected to holiness. It's more your personality. The point is to be constructive. Even when the Torah says, hey, that one should rebuke or um, inspire, however you want to translate another, it's for productive reasons. It's not because to vent and to get it off your chest because you're upset by it. That's not what the Torah is saying, because you're upset. That's why you um, do that. You're doing it because you can help that person. That's why there are all kinds of laws regarding that. And here it's very, very clear. Now, obviously, if you see someone who knows better and is doing that, I still don't think there's judgmentalism. So it has to be a different approach as opposed to the approach where you have to be kind and help a person come to understand where they are in a synagogue and so on. I remember vividly uh, an episode that probably no one else saw except me at a Fabrengen, because I stood across the Rebbe. It was in the middle of Fabrengen, it was in the, in the early Mems, and uh, the, rest, the Rebbe noticed, I saw the Rebbe would look, but I saw the Rebbe's eyes caught, something caught his eye to his right. And I was going toward the Oren Kedish, to the Rebbe's right. It was to my left. So I looked as well, and there was a guy in a talus davening. And he was davening while the Rebbe was speaking. Not directly in front of the Rebbe, he was sitting in the benches to, to the right of the Rebbe. But the Rebbe, it caught his eye, and the Rebbe kept looking. Didn't, let, didn't turn his head, but you could see the eye. If you stood across, you could see the Rebbe kept looking. And I saw the Rebbe was not happy with the situation. And, and there's no question in my mind that the Rebbe actually shortened the sicha. And then when the sikha was over, the guy actually started diving Shem uh, close to the end of the sikha. And the Rebbe was saying, L'chaim, L'chaim, but I saw that he kept on trying to see who this person is because the angle, you couldn't see his face because he was standing toward Mizrach, toward the Aaron Kedish. So his, not, his back was not to the Rebbe, but he was like somewhat of a, on a certain, like, a four, a, I guess, a 90 degree angle. That, and the Rebbe kept bending back in his chair like this, like just to see, but he was like making L'chaim, so you couldn't really tell. But I saw the Rebbe wanted to see who it was. And it took a few minutes, and the guy finally took three steps back and finished him Nesra. And when the Rebbe saw who it was, and I also saw because when he walked back, we all saw that angle, it was a person that you could see didn't know better. It wasn't like a Chesid uh, Shaid that knew he's by Fabrengen. But Pshita sent Mimus, in the middle of Fabrengen, he was davening. And I saw that physically the Rebbe's complexion and the Rebbe's face changed, melted in a way, much, much softer. The Rebbe was not happy seeing that. So you see from this, it all depends on the individual. But the general attitude is, is always better to, to cautious, to, um, to uh, what's the word I wanted to say, to be cautious on the side of, uh, to, to, to err on the side of being cautious of not to get trapped in the, in the judgmental type of attitude, which often feeds into some of the middas that are not so pleasant in each one of us. And as the Rebbe says there, how to look at a Jew in every given situation. There's more to say on this topic. I'll share one more thing that I heard there was in the, when the Israel became a state. So, of course, there's a communist party, as you know, in Israel, in the Knesset. And the communist party, there was a Jew. His name was, uh, um, his name was uh, Berliner, um, Vilner, Mayor Vilner. Mayor Vilner represented the communist party. They were the communist Jews. He was hated and loathed by, obviously, Israelis and, and Jews everywhere. So in the mid, so there was a time, and round in the mid, mid Chofs, I think Tov Shechovov or Chovzayin, someone went and stabbed him. It wasn't fatal, but they stabbed him because he said some type of very, uh, in, a very instigating words in the Knesset, and he upset someone. They went and stabbed. Him. There was a writer in Eretz Yisrael in one of the newspapers. I'm not sure which newspaper, and he wrote that the one who stabbed him made two mistakes. He should have stuck the knife deeper and should have turned it. Now it happened to be. This person who wrote it came to Tishrei that year, Chav Zayin or Chav Ches, to the to, to seven seventy to the Rebbe. When he went by for Lekach, I believe, yes, it was Lekach. So, so he, the Rebbe was told who he was, the writer. So the Rebbe said to him, "Not this is not the way you write on a Jew, even a Jew like that." The Rebbe didn't say that. I'm saying, 
You don't, that's not the way you write in a Jew. And what, what is a Jew, the Rebbe said? That will discuss Sukkot. Okay, that's what the Rebbe's words. He, he goes by the Lekach, so he goes into Rabbi Chadikov, uh, to Merkis, and says, the Rebbe told him that he understood the Rebbe wants to see him, that on Sukkot he should make an appointment, and he'll discuss with him what a Jew is. The Chadikov told him that there's no Yechidus on Sukkot. You know, should, after Tishrei, no problem. We'll make a schedule, fit you in, and you're going to Yechidus. Nobody's leaving right after Tishrei. Or Chalamei. No, he's leaving after Tishrei. Right away, and he can't remain. But the Rebbe did say it. So Rabbi Chadikov says, I'll check, but I'm almost sure there's no Yechidus. And he checked, and in the Chanami, there's no Yechidus. So Rabbi Chadikov said to him, the Rebbe said he'll speak about it. It doesn't say Yechidus. The Rebbe said, so come to the Fabrengans. You never, never know when the Rebbe will speak about this. And that's what he did. He came, those years there was a Fabrengan, there were two Fabrengans sukkahs in the sukkah, right near 770. Till Tov Shalama, there were Fabrengans there. And the Rebbe was speaking, I think it was Shabbos Chalamayid, or uh, maybe Simchus Veshev, I'm not sure which Fabrengan. And he comes in the middle of Fabrengan, and he was standing, the sukkah wasn't big. The Rebbe noticed him. As soon as he noticed him, the Rebbe started these words. Um, vos is Zayid, and what is a Jew? And the Rebbe said, it says in the end of Mesech Techigigah, it says, even sinners among Israel are filled with mitzvahs like a pomegranate, meaning like the seeds of a pomegranate. And the Rebbe said, what's the dimmium? Why is it compared to a pomegranate? So the Rebbe said, because a pomegranate, the seeds they all are separate. They're not part of the flesh of the, of, the, of the pomegranate itself, of the fruit. They're separated with a very thin membrane. It means the mitzvahs are there. However, it's not integrated and internalized by the Peshe Yisrael. But he's Malay Mitzvah's Kedim. He's filled with it. And the Rebbe went on to speak how a Jew, no matter where the situation is in, is always connected. So the person understood, of course. The writer understood what the Rebbe was saying. What's the Zayid? You have to understand what a Jew is. When you look at a Jew in that way, then it's a whole different way of looking when he brings a newspaper into a shul. Or he behaves in a, different, in a way that is not necessarily appropriate. You're looking to find in Chilika the Kamim al as the Rebbe says, the peace of God within him, so to speak, and see how to bring that alive, how to fan those flames. Now, they can go on and on, but the different stories, I'll, I'll share some more in future episodes. Let's move on to another subject. And um, next question Deciding where to live. Dear Rabbi Jacobson Schlitter, first of all, thank you so much for taking time to address all these subjects with all of us. It gives us all so much meaning and understanding to what Chassidus teaches us. I'm wondering if you can tell us what the Rebbe says about where a couple should settle after marriage. If, let's say, a spouse wants to move where their parents live in one country and the other spouse feels that they should live where their parents live in another country, in other words, the spouse's parents. One, how do they choose? Two, is preference given to one spouse over the other? Three, what if the parents are a factor in that decision, meaning that they give off messages of guilt Etc. Four, how does Kibbut Ava'im apply to this? I hope you'll be able to address this topic. Wishing you a Freilich and Chanak and that we all experience Chedus Amiti from all our Mitzarim Vagvulim. May we merit the ultimate redemption now. Well, we have to begin with, the, uh, of course, the big disclaimer. As usual, case by case. Very hard to give one size fits all answer because this is not a black and white question. You know, you can live anywhere in the world and fulfill your Shlichus in life. So, First thing I would say is you have to find your mashpia that you trust and hopefully, and even better one that both the couple trusts and discuss all the pros and cons of why you want to live in one country or another country. That's a general thing that you must do because that, that will address the particular issues that are specific to this given situation, what the reasons are. And the reasons can be from one extreme to another. They can be very legitimate reasons. They can be reasons that are just preferences or as the writer writes, guilt and things that may not be factors. But that being said, let me say a few klalim, a few rules that we know from the Rebbe, and also that are piter and chsidis, and that's number one. Number one is in general speaking, the Rebbe makes it very clear, parents shouldn't get involved in a, in a couple's geshef affairs. Not the parents of the, of the father, not the parents of the husband, not the parents of the wife. They have to deal with these things and themselves. And if parents want to be healthy, they should encourage them. Even if the child comes to you, they shouldn't just become a sympathetic ear. If anything, they should encourage them. On the contrary, listen to what your spouse has to say, respect your spouse, and figure it out. Because then you create a battle that is more than just 
the two people, I don't want to say the word battle, but a, a confrontation now becomes the parents are involved. And it's not just the, 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 the husband and wife, it's now also not just the spouses, it's their parents and families and so on. So that's a rule that parents should get uninvolved in this, and I would, that has to be neutralized. If the parents refuse to get non-involved for whatever reason, then I would say respectfully you could tell them that we hear what you're saying, but we'll make this decision on our own, and a husband and wife must be allies in this matter. Let them work it out on their own, and no one else has to get involved. That's one thing, to, get, to, to, to clear the air, meaning let's just contain it to what the issues are. And now as far as the issues themselves, as I said, they have to be addressed with a mashpia who understands the particular situation, you see this again and again. The Rebbe does not just give an answer. He always says, "Atzasi didim evinim." Go to people who are experts, who are friends, who know your situation. Arov, amashpia. And there's no black and white answer the Rebbe gives. Sometimes someone writes all the details. The Rebbe chooses if it's a matter of shlichus and so on. With that said, let's add some more factors that are important. Again, I'm not going to give you an answer what to do. I'm going to give you frame the questions. What questions should be asked? The next question should be asked is, "What is your shlichus b'chayim?" If the shlich is the mission of a person's life is not just parnasa, not just livelihood, and not just personal preferences because they like the weather in one place or another. It should be driven by why are you here on this earth? The Rebbe made it very clear. Why was he in America? Because this is where the shlich is, where Hashgach Pratis led him. So Hashgach Pratis is a major factor in where you are and what you're fulfilling your mission there. Now some people could say, well, I can fulfill the mission anywhere. Okay, if that's the case, fine. But the Rebbe makes it very clear that somebody who is a responsible party in a moesed, in an organization, in a moesed chinuch, educational organization, another organization, and they're needed, you can't just pick yourself up. Even going to Eretz Yisrael, because that's what you like, because there are others dependent on you. And this is where God led you, and you're living and you're, you're being matzliach. So why would you stop something you're being successful to go to another place where you may not be as successful? And even if there's a doubt, why go to a doubt when you have a vade, when you're sure? So that's another factor. As far as one spouse is deferring to the other, it's not necessarily the case. I mean, it, it, again, it comes down to the, fa- the reasons for it. And if it's just preferences and both have a different preference, you know, on one hand, Abishta told Avram to listen to Sarah, maybe not about where to live. Lech Lecham was a command of the Abishta to everybody to leave your comfort zone and not go back to your comfort zone, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, but bottom line is, you have to try to figure out what is your shlichus b'chayim. And sometimes where you are, your community may need you. You may be running, running an organization or working an organization that's necessary. That's a big factor. Now what happens if parnosa demands that someone go elsewhere because they can't make parnosa or their company says you must move? So that's one among many factors. I will not say that's the number one factor. It has to be weighed with everything else. There's also of their children. What's good for the children? To just suddenly take children out of schools and move to another place? It's very disorienting uh, for children and has impact. That has to be also taken in strong consideration. If there are no children yet or the children are very young, that fine. that's another factor. That's why all these factors have to be looked at. And finally, I want to say the following. Um, it's critical not to turn this into a personal thing. I want and who's going to win? It has to come down to a bitl dika thing. We were sent to this earth for a reason. The reason is to fulfill God's shlichus, as I said. That has to be the driving factor in the whole picture. I mentioned it before, but I just wanted to emphasize what is the center of the entire discussion. Um, there's actually a story where one person, where a mother, an almona, a widow, wanted her newlywed son to come to live with his wife by her. The Rebbe wanted to give them a shlichus, and at the end of the day, they didn't go on the shlichus. And the Rebbe writes in a letter in, Ta- in Tavshin Tezayin to this mother that he always thought a, wo- a mother, a chesedish, a woman, wants to have the benefit for her children more than her own benefit. And says, how could I build an army with soldiers who have to go ask their parents? So as far as Kibbut Avayim, read the Sikh of Shmini Tavshin Chai, and that letter, which is Bikitsa, but Shmini Tavshin Chai says, Kibbut Avayim is a great mitzvah, but finding find soldiers that are dedicated to the mission is another. Now, if someone's not about shlichus, Still, it depends on what their role and involvement in their community is. So I hope I framed it to some extent and help out with this. And uh, as I said, go to your local mashpia, someone you can trust. Another, a follow-up question. Did Freud influence the Rebbe Rashab? Shalom Rabbi Jacobson, I must tell you that I'm amazed each week the way you tackle all questions that come your way. And your answers are always on target. 
Thank you, and may you continue this great work with much Hatzlacha. I would like to ask your opinion on the topic that you addressed regarding the Rebbe Rashab. Visiting Dr. Freud. There are those who claim that Freud had an influence on the Maimodim that Rebbe Rashab said in the years following the visit. An article was published in Psycho- Psychoanalytic Review about this, claiming so. In addition, I always wonder if Freud had any influence in the sikha that was said on Yutas Kislev Tov, I guess you mean the Tov, not 5613, you probably mean Tov Reish Ayin Gimel, which I talked about, Chil Brisei, and I would like to know your take on this. Thank you. Well, I discussed at length the Freud Rebbe Rashab encounter and my understanding of it is elaborate, so I don't want to go over all of that, but I will say the following. I see no evidence or reason to say that Freud had an influence, and I would actually say he did not have influence. A Rebbe is a Rebbe. The influence on a Rebbe is what he says is coming from a greater place. And I don't think any person, whether it's Freud or anybody, has an influence. Even Chassidish Eden don't have an influence, let alone Freud. Influence could be, yes, someone asks a question and the Rebbe addresses a question or is addressing a need. But the Rebbe determines, and so to say an influence in the Maimonim that what? That yes, Freud did say to the Rebbe that he should re- reconnect with the Chassidim and see how he contributes to them and how they f- find them valuable. That's, uh, that was advice, which I'm sure, even without Freud, the Rebbe Rashab would have done. Every reason the Rebbe Rashab had to hear it from him, I discussed in that episode. But bottom line is, I see no evidence, I see no reason to say that. I don't see any shinui. The, the, the shittas of the Rebbe Rashab, as he developed Chassidus over the years, continue to grow and, uh, and uh, proliferate without any regard to uh, Freud's theories. These theories, well, anyone wants to show it, they would have to demonstrate which my modem exactly you're talking about, what Indian was said one way before Freud and after. These scholars may be scholars, but I don't think that they know which my modem, that they could talk about which my modem were influenced. So I would say absolutely not. As far as the Sikh of Tofre Shayin Gimel, printed in Teir Shalom, uh, Simchas I believe it was, oh, no, I'm sorry, Yutas Kislev, um, I, I don't see any connection, Freud, Freud had a very different view, a very uh, prohibited view, frankly, from a Torah point of view, the Rebbe Rashab is talking about Chassidus, I would even say between the Freud's approach and the Rebbe Rashab's approach. Again, I see absolutely no connection at all. And um, at the end of the day, the reasons that the Rebbe Rashab went, I discussed. I don't think you have to go further than that. It's enough what happened, and that's that. We don't have to go and start speculating more and more, especially things we have no clue about and we have no knowledge about. Okay, next question. Short anxiety follow-up question. Um, I talked about anxiety last week, and I wanted to mention. I was, I was, uh, someone brought it up to mention the pasuk im yidak adam yasicheno. So this is an issue I've addressed in the past. I just wanted to add that as a footnote. And there's the two interpretations of the Gemara. Yasicheno does it mean sicha to speak about it? Yasicheno hesichadas to push it away. And the Reb Marash asked the famous question, which again I cited many episodes back. It seems like a contradiction between the two. It's also brought in Ayyim Yim. Because to speak about it seems like focusing on it. To push it away from your mind seems like move, avoiding it. The answer is that by speaking about it, you release it. And you so-called, instead of dwelling and being consumed and obsessed with it, you release it, and that way you can push it away. So this is just a footnote in addition to the discussion last week about anxiety and how we um, have to focus on matters of productive helping other people and so on. There's also about mimicking follow-up. Um, was brought also a question that was asked that I, I spoke very briefly. I, I brought the, um, the Gemara, uh, among other things, the Gemara in Sukkot, Daf Lamed Beis, Hoyel V'nofug Mepumid Rabkana, where his ta- student, Rab Acha, behaved a certain way with Hadassim, a meaning, even though Rab, Rab Kana himself didn't follow it, but because it once came out from Rab Kana from his mouth, this type of approach, which is a certain way, how the Hadassim, two coming out of one, one uh, root or uh, uh, he followed it to show the chvivus, the value and the preciousness of something you hear from your Rebbe. And I use that in context. I also mentioned Rab Tarfin. The truth is, I didn't have the opportunity to really spell it out. But Rab Tarfin is a Gemara, a Mishnah actually, in Baruchas, Daf Yud, where Rab Tarfin did also follow his teacher, and he actually was rebuked for it. 
What's the story? The story is there that it was the calculations of when Yom Kippur comes out. So Shammai had his opinion. And Rabbi Gamliel, who was the Nasi of the time, had his opinion. And the halacha was like Rabbi Gamliel. But Rabbi Tarfim, because he valued so much his teacher, he actually, on the day that Rabbi Gamliel, was, he, he behaved on Yom Kippur, not like Rabbi Gamliel. So Rabbi Gamliel compelled him to actually walk in the street. The makle betarmile, the Rabbi uses that expression, with his stick and with his bag or with his mom and with his money, on the day that Shammai would, according to Shammai's calculations, would have been Yom Kippur, to demonstrate that you have to follow Allah and not follow what your teacher said. So I alluded to it by mentioning that Tarfin. So it's a contradiction. Here you see the value of following a teacher, even if it's not exactly what the, what the conclusion is in halacha. The answer is exactly as I discussed last episode. That's the balance. To go extremes is not an aderach. We have both eros and teirach. There's appreciating the value of and the preciousness of hearing something, cherishing what your Rebbe says, your Rebbe does. But to go to extreme and to do it to a point where it's either coming from a, from a, from a foolish place, or stam chosid sheita, or in a place where God forbid touches halacha in a way that is opposite, opposite of what the Rebbe would want, that is, you learn from Rav and it's not that way. So it's talking two different episodes, and we have to learn from both of them. Just the Chvivusa de Milsa, I don't have so much time to go into all the details. I just looked around a bit quickly and I see that Rebbe brings the Puma of the Rav Kana, Rugaba, many things. In Lukutis Sikhis Chelich of Beis, volume 22, he brings it about Matzah Shrui and Achrash of Pesach. Al Terebbe, that's why we eat Matzah Shrui or Mahadr in it for, this, for that reason. He brings it um, in Igris Kedish, volume 17, page 221. He brings it to the Gabbai Vishamru, not saying Vishamru Friday night before Shemun Esra. Achen Shab Pesach, Tavshin Yud Beis, the Rebbe brings it concerning Mikveh, and also Matzah Shriya, to do a Mikveh according to the way he saw so and by, the, by their Rabbeim. Um, Shina Besukah, about sleeping and not sleeping in a Sukkah based on the Mitla Rebbe, because Makif and the Bina, the Rebbe brings that in Kutis Sichus, Cheli Chov Tes, volume 29, page 218. And there's more. There's about payas. There's about uh, not wearing tchelis. There's about um, the way we uh, we do we do we do hadlokas aneris actually Hanukkah and Purim, which we do Hanukkah we do it inside not by a window, and a few other things that the Rebbe brings about also the vishes that, that that a single person does not have to wear a talis if he has an aliyah or goes as a chazan. All this that ever brings the Puma de Rabkana. So that just shows that it's used more of one place, that concept. Okay. Let's continue the follow up about Meshechism. Okay. I just want to make sure I'm covering everything. Yeah. So we got a few more letters, and I, probably this will be my uh, concluding remarks on this topic. And people continue to be very heated and emotional and passionate about it, which is uh, excellent, you know. <clears throat> and uh, let me read a few comments and then I'll respond. I see you take a very unbiased view on the topic of messianism. However, can you please address instead of from the attacking view against messianism, and instead discuss how the Rebbe, with all his strength, encouraged the singing of Yechia Denenu in the years of Nun Gimel and Nun Dalad. How is a chassid supposed to be completely against the topic of the Rebbe being called as Mashiach when the Rebbe in those years was so supporting it? Do you say? Do they say that the Rebbe made a mistake? God forbid. It seems that those against, unless they do not know altogether, erase those years out of history and since, since it is never addressed at all. If these chassidim are timid or in doubt or think that the Rebbe did make a mistake, then perhaps he made mistakes in other issues as well. Does the Sheftim Nun Aleph Sikha mean anything or not? Okay. <clears throat> all those who are not Meshachist and talk all the time about how we need to be Makusha to the Rebbe, connected to the Rebbe. Yeah, what about this topic? Is it MS? Is it true or not? Thank you for your consideration to address this important issue. Feedback number two. Rabbi Jacobson, I really do admire how you try not to avoid the tough issues and to tackle every subject. But I feel you have been equivocating the past two weeks on the Meshachist topic. Your tirutzim deflect the question, the tirutzim quote-unquote, deflect the question rather than answering it. You either minimize the issue, non-religious people don't even care, Misnagdim didn't like us long before the Meshachistim, 
Or you put the onus back on the question, how dare you complain? If you don't like it, then what are you doing to spread a positive message? That's not an honest way of dealing with the question. This is a serious subject, and forgive me, you're playing games. This is not something you can be neutral about, however politically expedient you think it may be. I am bothered by the fact that you are not taking a middle-of-the-road approach. That, I'm, I'm bothered by the fact that you are taking a middle-of-the-road approach, which is willfully ignorant. If you want to be true to your mission statement, then go ahead and align yourself with one way or the other, one way or the other, and then back it up with your sources. With sources. Are you for or against the chi and all that goes with it? Why or why not? Take a stance. I think you can handle this question. I find I find these these direct um, letters very uh, refreshing, and thank you. Well, I will respond. Feedback number three, and then. I was quite surprised and disappointed to see in your last episode how you read a letter from a serious anti, in my opinion, which could potentially lead to a big chil labavitch chaz I say this not to cause pain, but in the hope that you could correct that fellow's corrupted observation. In my personal dealings with those who are from but not labavitch, I have found that when I speak with an emes, truth, I'm not even talking about yechi itself, people respect it. People want to hear the emes. I know you tried to explain things, but I felt the week before it was much more well put, and I did feel that you seemed a little intimidated by that anti-writer. I do not think the problem is starting with outsiders as much as it is the fear and antis within Labavitch. I'm convinced that the biggest kill Labavitch, especially regarding this subject, is coming sadly from so-called Labavitch website that has done more harm than every Meshachiz combined could ever do. I would not be surprised if he and any other anti-writing to you has been terribly brainwashed on this topic, especially from that particular website. Every real Meshachist, I'm not talking about crazy ones, has Sichus Kedish to back up their attitudes. Being Mekabal, Mashiach, was not made up by Chassidim, it was the Rebbe who initiated it. Giving over sources to your listeners, I think will help those who really want answers. You do not have to read this publicly. It's a note to you with the hope that you will correct the negative attitudes and set things straight in connection to the horrible politics in hopefully a more confident way with true sources from our Rebbe. This week's episode on this topic, especially hearing that anti-letter, left me with a bitter taste in promoting Pesudah Sagu'ula, and I feel like it could have potentially Chaz Rishon weakened those who want to follow the Rebbe's directive to get the world ready for Mashiach. Again, many of the lines you used were okay, but the general feeling seemed to me like the anti has a cause. Please forgive me for my straightforward, straightforward and harsh tone. Thank you very much. Okay. What can I say? This reminds me, back and forth, back and forth, my father once told me that he was by the Rebbe in Yechidus, and they were talking about the newspaper, the Algemeiner, and the Rebbe was asking what people think, and that's an approach that my, my father said, some people tell him that the newspaper is not religious enough. And the Rebbe smiled and said, and I'm sure there are people who say it's too religious. This is what happens when you're in a public forum, you try to present things, you see the letters, I mean, I've, I've absolutely read them without, without a touch of editing, from one extreme to the next. It reminds me as well, when my book, Toward a Meaningful Life, was published in 1995. It was a year after Gimel Tammuz. And, uh, and the book had then started getting out there. It reached Australia. I get a frantic call from my good friend, Chaim Tzvi Groner, Rabbi Chaim Tzvi Groner from Melbourne, Australia. And he says to me, I must resolve something with you right here and there. I just came from a Sheva Brachas, and there was a, 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 one of the Choshev of Anash said to me, you see, Simon writes in his book, Toward a Meaningful Life, because at the end there's a, uh, a prologue, um, an epilogue, I should say, an epilogue at the end, talks about the Rebbe as Mashiach. He says, All right, the Rebbe is not Mashiach. And Chaim Shri Grona says to him, it's impossible, I know Simon. He may not write the Rebbe as Mashiach, but there's no way that he wrote the Rebbe is not Mashiach. So he wants to ask me directly. So I said, you have the book, what does it say? He says, I can interpret it one way, he interprets it another. And I said, Hichiatoni, you, you made me, you consoled me, you made me feel good. Why? That's exactly what people do with the Rebbe Sichas. This one reads it and sees this, and this one reads it and sees that. I fed Baruch Shekivanti that I actually, it was a line that people can read the same thing and have two different conclusions. Because what do I write there? The publisher insisted that I write something. I didn't want to write, to be honest. Why? Because I'm presenting the Rebbe's ideas. The Rebbe is his teachings, what he wants from us. And the Rebbe wouldn't want us to be obfuscated and hijacked by side sensational discussions. So I didn't want to write about that. I wrote about Gula Mashiach. There's a whole chapter about it. I wrote about other topics. I want to, you want to know the Rebbe? This is what he teaches. But because it was in the news and people talked about it, the publisher insisted that I write something. So that's what I wrote. That I didn't want to write about this. The publisher wanted me. Why? Because this takes sidetracks. The Rebbe always said, 
The bottom line is Maisu Bepeil. But that came out the Alta the Truva the Alta the Gula the Frida Kareb. There was also a tumult, and the Frida Kareb asked the Rebbe, "What's people saying in the street?" They say people are saying that the Rebbe has declared himself as being Mashiach. The Frida Kareb said, "No, Abi Mered Vega Mashiach. I don't mind Abi Mered Vega Mashiach." The Kapishnitzer Rebbe said something similar, and the Rebbe cites it in Tov Shechov Beis, one of the Fabrengans. The Rebbe cites that they, the Kapishnitzer Rebbe said, "But Alta the Truva the Alta the Gula." That people are saying. That the Rebbe is declaring himself, the Chassidim are calling him Mashiach. So the Kapishna of the Rebbe answered very wisely. He said, you know that, and people came to him and said, you have to come out against it. He says, you know that you're not Mashiach. I know I'm not, I'm not Mashiach. Why do you mind that they think he is? So you have to take, this is not about taking a middle ground. I'm not trying to be politically correct. And you'll see in a moment why I'll elaborate a little more about this. It's looking for MS, as I said in the last episode. We're looking at Tatus MS. I am not going to get caught up in political and individual issues here. We're going to talk Tera or we're not going to talk. I'm not interested in talking non Tera and non Chassidus. As I said, everything has to have sources. We know what the Rebbe said in the Sikhs, they could be interpreted in many different ways. And I'm not here to go start interpreting. When I wrote the Fabrengans, as I was, I was a Chazer and a Maniach, my schus was to voice what the Rebbe says, not what I say, not what anyone else says. Chassidus Ergeshim is for Chassidus Fabrengans. Then there's what the doctrine says. And the doctrine, you can know you can clearly that the Rebbe wanted things written. Sometimes he wanted to be gray and, and a little more ambiguous and change things in order for it not to be so spelled out. He many times said, I don't want it spelled out black and white. The Rebbe was wise enough to understand that some things have to be said, some things have to be understood between the lines or explained. Or left the different ways, like the Rebbe wrote, each place to interpret. That's what Tate is. The things that are must be said must be said. So let's apply this the Tater approach to these questions. Yechi, the Rebbe, Mashiach. Not one person has ever done that. That's why, even though I read the letters, but I have to be honest, I don't respect a letter that does not use Tater basis. What's the Tater basis for everything? A source. Instead of just demanding from me to say this, to say that, why don't we talk sources? So we know in Tater there's three categories. And listen closely, especially those people that wrote this. Listen closely. There's a mitzvah, there's an Aveda, and there's Rishus. A mitzvah means you must do it. An Aveda means, means you're not allowed to do it. And a shus, which is actually the largest body of our choice, is choice. You eat a meal, is a shus. How you're going to eat it, you can eat it l'shem shemaim, you can eat it neutrally, or you can eat it, God forbid, indulge. So there are things that are mitzvah, Aveda, the shus. That's why you have to pose it. Is it a mitzvah to say yechi? Unless the Rebbe, unless it says the Shulchan Aruch, or the Rebbe said it's a mitzvah, there's no such mitzvah. Is it an Aveda, a sin to say it? Or to think it or to feel it? I never saw a prohibition. Not from the Rebbe. The Rebbe, as, as one writer writes, did encourage the nigan. That doesn't make it a mitzvah. It means that it's permitted. And everyone has different meanings and what the Yechi means anyway. The same thing, the Rebbe being Mashiach. I've, I've asked this question thousands of times, as you can imagine, by all types of audiences. And I always answer the same thing. It doesn't make a difference what I feel. Since when am I the decider and factor? It would be the equivalent of asking the Havdala, Supreme Court Justice, do you believe in freedom of speech? You know what he should answer? It makes no difference what I believe. The Constitution of the United States guarantees it, so I have to uphold it. We have a tater and halacha to prevent emotional, uh, partisan, and parochial feelings about things. The questions are very, very. Let's let's take away emotions. There's a tater that says about that Mashiach is going to come. How do we know? The Abishta said so. That Mashiach is a boss of Adam. The Abishta said so. Could have not been that way. God wanted it that way. That's how we know. Not because of logic. Uh, do we know criteria that defines Mashiach? It says in some things in the Rambam. Some things don't say. The Rambam says there are things we don't know. Then go study the Rebbe's life and see, is he a candidate or not? Same question after Gimel Thomas. You could say, okay, he was a candidate then. Is it possible that a person after Gimel Thomas should return? Again, it's a halacha question. A teda question. A shkofa question. However you want to put it. I am not, if you can point me as your rabbi, I'm your authority, and you listen to everything I say, then I'll engage in a discussion with someone that sees me that way. But just to, for me to go here and sensationalize this topic, go to your Rav, find halachic sources, and ask them that question. I have not seen any psak din, even from the most bitter anti lubavitcher anti-Mishachist, that says a psak din, you're not allowed to say yechi or something like that. Most likely because they don't have a mocker to say it's also. They could say it's not normative Judaism, it's not mainstream, it's not the way we always thought about it. Fine. 
But th- this is the way I would frame this whole discussion. And this is the way I'm, I'm going to address it. And, I'm, I'm going, and, I, and, and especially controversial topics and emotional ones need even more important that we stick to what the Tater says and what the Tater doesn't say. And that's, that's, that's what I would say about all of this. No, I'm not uh, stepping around. I'm not uh, intimidated, nor am I uh, disturbed to say I could just say exactly what I just said. And, um, and, uh, and if you accept what I said, which is based on Tater, then great. If not, uh, what, can I do, what can I do for you? Um, what else? Let me just say, make sure I covered everything. Yeah. Good. Um, that Al Rebbe Rashaba concluded with one final said, did not like people making pshat lachin tanya, but he said if it adds in Yiddish shemayim, it's fine. I would say the same thing here. If this adds in Yiddish shemayim that a person feels that their Rebbe is Mashiach, and it adds in Yiddish shemayim that they say or they think or they feel yechi. By all means, it adds Tater Mitzvahs. Unless, again, it's us. If someone can show that, let them prove that. That's how I would approach the entire thing. And everything has to be done with moderation. Everything has to be done with balance. In a Tater, Chassidish, intelligent way, as I said, to do something that turns others off. And definitely to impose on others is definitely not acceptable. Where does the Tater say that you should impose on anyone? That is not acceptable. That's Takenat. And Aved, I don't know if it's called a sin, but it's definitely not Rishus. It's not, it's not supposed to be. Okay. One final, uh, you know, you know, I'm going to, um, you know, let's go because I have time is limited. Let's do the follow-up to the Chassidus question, part two, as I promised, and that's the issue of Tzimtzum Kipshutei. So I discussed last week. I began by discussing the um, the Rebbe's letter in Tafrit Sadik Tess, printed in Volume One of Yigus Kedesh, page 19, the four different ways that the Rebbe sees. Uh, the, 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 Rebbe, the Rebbe sums up the shittas about Simpson. Now, um, we know in the Shimas, that same letter to Rabbi Ben Yaminson, the Rebbe added things about those four opinions. And uh, I'll just give you a share. He says that the first opinion, which is that the Simpson is an etzim itself, is, the, is that which written by Yesh Yeshel Levov, which is the Sefer by the Baal Mishnah Chassidim, from the Tamidi Guri Arizal, the Tamidim of the students of the students of the Arizal. Mishnah Chassidim is a very uh, venerated book and sefer, and even though that's his opinion, that's an atzmos sefer. The second opinion that the tzimtzum is kipshute, but only in Eir, the Rebbe seems to think that, or seems to suggest that the Gra writes that because the Rebbe could not find in the Gra's words that the tzimtzum is not atzmos. Even though from the Alter Rebbe and what was known was that the, the Misnagdim, the Talmud Yehagra, embraced the Gra's opinion, which would be more like the Yeshua Lavov. So the Rebbe brings that. As far as the third opinion, that it's not Kipshuti, it's not literal. The Rebbe writes, which means it's concealed but not removed. Simpson would be from the word concealment instead of Siluk, removed, um, is the Shemer Amunim, very likely. Again, the Rebbe says that it's not so clear, but that's what it is. And of course, the fourth opinion is Chassidus Chabad, and that's what we don't move from. That is our approach. Now, briefly, what is the difference between the four and Avedis Hashem? So I once wrote an article about this to suggest that perhaps this is how you can understand it. I mentioned last week, when you say Tzimtzum Kipshute, you have to also wonder another question. What does it mean, Tzimtzum Kipshute, for, for us or from God's point of view? Because from God's point of view, you could argue that all four opinions, nothing is concealed. From God's point of view, God sees everything and is there within existence. The only question is whether from our point of view is God actually removed or not. But you can't really say that because the whole argument is not just from our perspective. It's whether there is an objective reality that God, godliness cannot coexist with existence as we know it. And therefore they argue like the king that has to look through the window to see, to, to, because he can't be in the place of waste, of ashpa. And there's a maimer actually in, um, I'm not sure which, I think it's an ekev maimer of Zion maybe. It's in Masef Mamor Malukit Chilik Dalad Omid um, Shin Shin Mem 340 that talks about Simpson and Atkep Shuti means two things. That number one, that even after the Simpson, the alien self is still there, just like before. And number two, that it does not conceal anything f- compared to the divine. So clearly from that, Simpson Kipshuta, on the other hand, would. So what difference does it make in practical practicality? You can say the following that the relationship that we have according to the first three opinions is a limited one. 
You cannot have the coexistence between the divine and our on our lowly existence. So therefore, you can only have a relationship with the divine on a min, on a limited way, like let's say a servant to a master. Because as soon as you explain that Elokus is here with us, and and it's, and it's not literally removed, that's where everything gets complicated. It's much easier to explain things according to the opinion of Tzimtzum Kipshute, because that way you don't have to reconcile Ahdus Hashem. You could just say God removed himself, and we'll soon mention how he could do that through his power to be able to call Yachel to do anything he wishes. And that's that. The challenge is, according to the Alter Rebbe, that Elokus is here, not just Eir, but not just Eir, but also Etzem, or not just Etzem, also Eir, that's where you have the challenge, how do you reconcile it? And that's where you need much more explanation. The Rebbe Nasich in Moshpatim Tov Shem Chav Zayin is printed in uh, volume 21, Lukut Sikh is page 428. The Rebbe says, according to those opinion, opinion of Tzimtzum Kipshutei, you, you don't have a question of how there's ribui, for example, how from a unit, uh, from, from one from an indivisible unit came multitude. Because you could all say that multitude is outside of the realm of the divine. And that's in the power of Kol Yachl. There's also no question about the issue of, let's say, you do a mitzvah. According to the fact that it's a tzimtzum, is only compared to us. So really, the klaf, before you even write the tefillin or sefer teda, it is also holy. The Rebbe has a whole arichas there about that. According to that opinion, there's not a problem with that. Because it's taka removed. But according to the opinion of Chesidus Chabad, that alakus is in the klaf, is in the parchment, as in the material world, even before you do a mitzvah. What does a mitzvah accomplish? So there the Rebbe answers, because the tzimtzum itself has substance, kalim, etc., which is not the scope of our discussion here. So, frankly, in many ways, it's much easier to understand things in that context. And the Rebbe Taka made this point, it's one of the chidushim of the Rebbe in understanding the whole idea of Tzimtzum Kipshute. So what would be the difference between the four opinions? Briefly, and I see I'm going to have to have a third part for this because of time limitations. Briefly, you would say like this, according to the Yeshe Levov, or maybe the Gra as well, if he's the one that holds that as well, you have to say that essentially we don't have a relationship with Atzmus altogether. Completely beyond us. Ein lono esig b'nestodis, malafonim, malaochid, it's a completely different reality. That means even when you dig, you're not going to be able to connect to that because Atzmus removed himself. According to the second opinion, that the tzimtzum is kipshute, literal, removed, but only in the oir. So you'd say the etzem is there, which means amun apshuta, the, if you dig enough, you can find the unconscious connection to the divine. But on a conscious level, you can never have divine consciousness and human consciousness to coexist because of the loneliness of this, the loneliness of our existence. The third opinion would be that it's not literal. You'd say, okay, it's not removed, but it's concealed. If it's literally in the, in, in the third opinion, which is also in the moir, in the source, it's also concealed. Then you would say that you don't have that much. You have some relationship, but it's a concealed state. And you can never really have a full relationship with, with uh, the uh, with etzem, because it's taken not removed, but he's been affected in the sense that you have a limited relationship, not as deep as opinion number one, but still enough to to make a difference. And number four, which is the shita of Chabad, Alter Rebbe Shita, there you have a relationship both with the divine consciousness because it's only concealed from us and we can see it, and also from the divine unconsciousness or even deeper unconscious, the etzem, because all of them are here. It's just that we don't have access to it because we, on our end, are limited. But the potential is enormous. However, that poses a whole new series of questions, and that's why the Rebbe says that when he was asked this question, and let me trace the steps, I found the first time the Rebbe says that the shita of Tzimtzum Kipshutei is Mitzad Kal Yochel is a letter from the Rebbe Yud Mar Cheshvin, I'm sorry, Yud Aleph Mar Cheshvin, Tovshin Chof Aleph, Igris Kedish, Volume 20, page 18. And that's the first time I found that the Rebbe says that uh, the people who hold some scripture is because they believe in the Kayach Kol Yochel. Because there the only question is, how could God do such a thing? The answer is, we don't understand. God can do anything He wants to do. And then the Rebbe elaborated on this the next time was Shmini Atzeres Tovshin Lamed Aleph by the Suda. The Rashag was dismissing that opinion. And the Rebbe went into a whole discussion in the Suda of Shemini Atzeret by day, Tav Shalom and Aleph, and said, Ad it's much, much more sense to go with Simpson because you're talking about before Seichel was created. 
before Seichel was created, before the Tzimtzum, what makes most sense? The easiest way to explain this whole issue, you don't have to deal with the complications of Agdus, uh, unity of the divine in a place of waste or in a place of a multitude, etc., is the Tzimtzum not Kipshut. And the Rebbe says there, it's only because the Alter Rebbe was Makabal. He heard from his teachers that that's not the case. That's why he went and explained what he says in Pedic Zion, that's Memikri Haguf, that they made the mistake because they're trying to com- compare Eberster to uh, some type of uh, anthropomorphic uh, element of something that is related to say God removed himself. How could he remove himself? Atmos is not bound by space and time as we know it, etc. And that's because they're trying to explain Api Seichel their way and that Abed, he was accomplished from his teachers otherwise. Now, there's more on this. Because of time, I will have to uh, defer to the next episode. So we will do a third part on this and simply because of time limits. And I want to do at least the, the three essays. So three essays for this week. Um, again, you could, you could see all the essays at, uh, by, by subscribing to our uh, weekly newsletter at MeaningfulLife.com, our new beautiful site, and as well as going to MeaningfulLife.com forward slash my life forward slash essays. So here are the um, three. First is, uh, is Practical Steps for Staying Connected by Yisrael Joran. H44, Passaic, New Jersey. Imagine the following scenario, Yisrael writes. You wake up to learn that a good Samaritan, a complete stranger, had performed CPR on you after you have collapsed, giving you life-sustaining breaths from their own lungs until you are able to breathe on your own. Without their breaths, you would have died. Similarly, when you think about it, although we don't think about it, God breathed into us, giving us a part of himself, giving us life, as we learn in chapter 2 of Tanya, Signing the Zohar. If we internalize this teaching that we have to, so to speak, a deep that we have, so to speak, a deep part of God within us, we would be more fully alive, shedding insecurity, anxiety, and depression. We would be grateful to God for giving us life. However, instead of being aware of the godliness within, most of us go through life defining and limiting ourselves by our mistakes or by the way in which we think about or think others perceive us or have treated us, causing misery for ourselves and others. And he goes on to explain this concept in Chsidis how one can work on discovering that part that really God is breathing you just like that CPR example that he gave. Very creative and interesting and and concludes with a series of steps that when people face challenges, how to reconnect to that place inside of you, uh, different meditations and thoughts. Same thing when speaking to others and talk to God and how to speak to God and remember the rainbow which is used as the lesson from Yosef, Ksenis Pasim, Yosef's multicolored shirt in using that concept of balance of discovering the divine within us. Okay, that's essay number one. Next essay, My Actions by Mordechai Wilshinsky, age 30, KPMG, tax associate, New Haven, Connecticut. My Actions. Here he begins, Every individual is required to do their avoid in accordance with their essential being and their unique qualities. A person who has the ability to pierce pearls or polish gems, yet it occupies himself with baking bread, Although it is a much needed task, nonetheless it is considered as a sin for that individual. Hayyem Yem Chav Hay, 25th of Nisan. And then he goes on to explain how Chassidus helps you actualize yourself. It's not just about serving God, but also you uniquely serving God. On the other hand, it's not just about you, it's about God. That balance, are you serving or is it about actualizing yourself and having the proper bitl? And he is very interesting. Take Leitia Mishakela from Tavshin Yud Beis as well as some other Maimorim that he cites um, in, in, in applying this idea. Again, a very well-written essay, and I definitely recommend reading it, how we balance those two, individuality and divine service. And finally, essay number three, Conquering Apathy by Yermio Harrison, age 47, technology consultant, Montreal, Quebec. The older Chassidim, he writes, were known for their love of God, a fiery passion that burned in them, keeping them warm amidst the coldest environments. Today, we don't have the challenges they had, and yet we have apathy. What can we do in the face of our own apathy? And he goes on to try to suggest ways to approach it. He uses the Maimer of Isha Achas from Tovshin Mem Aleph, based on the Alter Rebbe's Maimer, that no matter what, you always have the, that crucible of oil. And, uh, and, and how we can, based on that, even when we seem devoid and we seem empty, we can rebuild our lives. It's a short essay but has a powerful, punchy message. And that does it for the essays. So, yes, I will continue part three, as I said, of Simpson Kripshute. 
and I thought some interesting things that I will share with you. So it's not over yet. It's some very fascinating stuff from the Rebbe. And let them I conclude again with a Freilich and Zeis Hanukkah to take the full eight days, the full assault of all the possible light we have from the, from the entire spectrum, not just of Shiva, but also Eshmeinah. It says Zeis Hanukkah, not just of the seven midas, but also the Mshacha from Keser. And that we have from beyond existence, beyond Ishtal a transcendent energy that transcends all of existence. And we draw it down on this day. Every Shem, everyone should have a very illuminating Shish Hanukkah, and it should be a pool in the Mshachas. And that we should continue perpetuating it through the entire year, an illuminated life. And ultimately, Zecha, as soon as before Hanukkah even ends, the Gula Amitiz Vashlema. This has been My Life Chassidus Applied, episode 94, every Sunday, 8 to 9 p.m. Please send in your questions anonymously at MeaningfulLife.com forward, uh, meaningfullife.com forward slash my life. And you have there an, a form that you could uh, fill in, a form that you could fill out anonymously or send me an email at simon at meaningfullife.com if you want a direct response. Everything is confidential. It's an honor, as always, to be able to try to take some things from Chassidus, apply it to our challenges. A very good gebench to Zeis Chanek and a Yarn a lichtige Tomit.